and Amoka Brands, Yat Su. He is the executive chairman, and he is going to be joining the founder of the Mage Group, Bowie Lau, and the co-host of Web Summit, uh, sorry, Wow Summit, uh, right now. So ladies and gentlemen, here you go, Bowie Lau and our own Yat Su from Hong Kong. Cheers. Welcome to WOW Hong Kong Summit 2023 here in Hong Kong. I am Bowie Lau, the co-host for the conference. And today I have the privilege and honor to speak with the legend, co-founder and the chairman of Anivoca Brands, Yasiu. Great to have you, Yat. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here, even if virtual. Sure. Well, let's uh, break the ice. What is the most annoying question you hate answering? I think the question that's probably um, uh, annoying might be a bit of a harsh word, but you know, typically I, you know, when I'm asked the question, isn't the metaverse dead? Isn't NFTs, you know, gone, right? Um, and every time I respond, obviously it's not. But the point is, is that, you know, I think there's a, a lot of ignorance that comes in the question. It's not a research question. I think what makes it annoying is that it doesn't come from fact. It just comes from feeling. So, sure. so that's probably, that's probably, uh, maybe one of the more annoying questions I have to answer. Sure, makes all. sense. <laughs> right. So what is the most favorite question that you like to be asked then? Well, I, I usually like to answer questions around the impact that Web3 has. Like that's course, those kind of questions I love to answer. Like, you know, how is it changing people's lives? What has it done for artists? Or what has it done for teachers? Or what has it done for people in developing countries? Uh, that Those are things that I love to answer because there are facts behind it and there are stories to explain. and no, they're very inspirational as well in terms of the things that it's done for their lives. So, so yeah, I, I love to talk about that, generally speaking. Great, absolutely. So it has been a few months since we spoke um, last year, and obviously a lot of incidents have happened at the scene, right? So yes. let's give some facts. Even today, Bitcoin has outperformed the majority of asset classes, up by 68% plus. In comparison, gold is up by 8.3%. NASDAQ is up by 17.5, and S&P 500 is even up by 3.8%. Uh, but, you know, reviewing the uh, U.S. Uh, regional bank's ETF is down by 25.39%. So we obviously, we know Silvergate, uh, Silicon Valley banks, and signature banks fell, and most recently, Credit Suisse. Silicon Valley Bank's UK arm was acquired by HSBC, and Credit Suisse is being acquired by UBS. Now, what are your views on the current overall Web3 landscape and also the current situation of the decline in the popularity in NFT? Right, so I mean, first question in relation to the well, sort of general landscape on sort of crypto. If you take a look at what happened with Bitcoin and Ethereum, right, it takes a lot uh, for, for um, you know, Bitcoin and Ethereum to rise the way that it did. And I think for the first time, we're sort of seeing what a lot of people said was going to happen, which you know, I've been waiting for years to, to say that, oh, look, actually crypto is a hedge to what's happening in the traditional financial system, particularly now that people have a better understanding as to some of the risks around fractional reserve banking and all the things that have happened in the industry at large. I think certainly what happened with uh, Silicon Valley Bank was a big shock to the system. But broadly speaking, I think what most people, if you think about two or three years ago, when a lot of people were interested in crypto particularly and trying to get into that space, they would say it's a hedge, but in reality, it was probably driven by greed, as in by FOMO, right? It's like, oh, you know, everyone else is making money, I need to make some money too. That was kind Absolutely. of what people were motivated two to three years ago. Whereas at least anecdotally this year, it feels very different, uh, where people are getting into the space as a true hedge. Maybe they're not putting a large percentage of their wealth in it, but they're putting a very small percentage into it as a means to sort of sort of insulate against some of the problems they might see, which is really, if you think about it, you know, the origin of crypto back in you know, 2009 was actually a revolt against what's going to happen. And you know, within the industry, there's also a little bit of this joke, which is like they can hear the printer is starting to work very soon, if not already, right? So, so that's kind of that, right? Everyone knows that probably that the, uh, you know there's no no increases in rates. In fact, very likely rates might potentially even get cut. Who knows? But you know the point being that uh, you know what's the way in which you can make sure that you're not inflated out of your um, sort of currency assets, and and that's basically why crypto suddenly has become 
a very interesting narrative. Uh, and in comparison to even three or say five, five years ago, the knowledge around the underlying reasons why crypto uh, and sort of digital assets is interesting is much more sophisticated. So therefore the understanding that it could actually function as a hedge is much more stronger than it was three years ago where you know people were generally thinking of it purely in speculative items. Uh, so, so I think that that bodes well. And I actually think we've hit a new kind of floor uh, in terms of the, the prices where it fluctuates between them. But I think we're not um, going to be seeing sort of sub 20,000 for, for quite some time, at least uh, when it comes to comes to Bitcoin. In terms of the current situation about NFTs and metaverse. So certainly it's been talked about less in sort of the broad media or press. Uh, and I think a lot of attention has been brought onto companies like Facebook when you know, they had to cut all these people. Does it mean that the metaverse is not working? Is Facebook's direction? But, you know, Facebook's strategy in metaverse has nothing to do with Web3. But sometimes people mix them up and confuse them. Last year, in what is supposed to be, you know, the height of a bear market, at least in terms of crypto, NFT sales was over $24 billion. Wow. Now, you know, that that's actually kind of similar, if not slightly higher, than the year before. So, you know, that's pretty good for a dead market. And, uh, and in fact, in, in just closing in the month of February, NFT sales alone was $2 billion, not to mention the general rise in sort of, sort of fungible tokens, but just talking about the non-fungible token industry continues to hum along quite well. So even for ourselves, when we launched uh, our own Mochaverse NFT project not too long ago, it had a pretty successful uh, launch. You know, the value of the NFTs continue to maintain quite well community is active, there's excitement in the space. So I think what has, however, changed is that the number of projects that are rolling out from unknown players is much reduced. So in a year to a year and a half ago, you had a lot of companies issuing NFT projects that, frankly speaking, you didn't know their background, maybe they were anonymous. You know, it just felt like everyone was just, you know, running as fast as they could because they just saw ways in which they could monetize in very extractive manners, which wasn't obviously healthy or good. Now, you know, because of the bear market, the companies that are succeeding in the space tend to be companies that have established reputations, that are bigger in profile, that people know that there's serious builders behind it. So whether you see this with us or Sandbox or Yuga Labs, you know, with Bored Apes or Cool Cats, right? These are projects that have substance behind them and continue to do quite well. So you can see a little bit more of a concentration in that space. When it comes to the metaverse as a whole, we're still very, very early. People are still onboarding faster than they did before in terms of ratio of people coming from gaming and coming from other areas of culture. So we're not seeing it decline. But I think, you know, whereas a year ago, every time there was a media article, it would always talk about the metaverse or NFTs. So it feels a little bit, it's not that the industry has declined. It just feels that it feels like, you know, it's, you know, people don't talk about it. So it doesn't seem as relevant because everyone's talking about AI and chat GPT and that kind of stuff. Yeah. But in reality, actually Web3 and the metaverse actually continues to grow. And, you know, I'll close with this thought, you know, Web3 and, you know, the, the thing that we always talk about is digital property rights, we think becomes even more vitally important in an age of AI. Because when you think about what the AI generates its value from, it comes from data that is generated by us. Who owns that data? We own that data. But the problem is that, you know, without something like blockchain on Web3, we actually have a problem in terms of knowing whose data it is, whose property is this, whose value is generated. And therefore, we can't then share the appropriate value because they just copied the image or they just download the image from something. There's this famous case where, you know, Getty Images is uh, suing the creators of Stable Diffusion for having built an AI model that learned its knowledge through the data set of Getty Images images. Um, now, that's obviously Getty. They can, they can do that. But imagine what this means for every artist or creator or photographer or content creator or data creator in the world, which includes people like you and me. Uh, you know, we, we, um, we need a way in which we can get rewarded for our contribution to the AI framework as well, which currently uh, without Web3 doesn't exist. So I think, you know, generally speaking, Web3 in the metaverse continues for that reason to be very, very critically important. Um, even if it happens a little bit more on the background, it will continue to grow as it has done so in the last few years. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Uh, even now we're having this uh, bear market. Um, I think is is actually a good thing because all these bad apples, all these scam projects will will be gone. And uh, I mean, most of them are gone anyway. Mm -hmm. And uh, the genuine project, you know, are going to stay and continue to do their work. 
and contribute to the ecosystem. So I definitely couldn't agree more. Uh, but in Hong Kong, I think this is a lot more exciting yes. and positive, you know, uh, development here in the region. So just to give some background, last December, the Legislative Council of Hong Kong passed an amendment to the anti-money laundering and counter-terrorist financing orders, aka AMLO. Uh, introducing a licensing regime for virtual asset service providers, uh, we just call VASP. Uh, so that way it, gets, it, was, um, it provided uh, very clear guidance at a higher level of what are the legal and regulatory treatment of cryptocurrencies. And also importantly, what are the expectations from these uh, virtual asset service providers and what type, which type of investors that can really access, access to this service provider. And it will be effective on June 1st this year. What are your views on these licensing regime for the virtual access uh, service providers in Hong Kong? So first of all, generally speaking, anytime you introduce regulation in an industry, broadly speaking, you're sending a signal to the market. So, you know, a lot of people, you know, were, would say, oh, regulation, doesn't it stifle innovation? Doesn't it create a situation where maybe it would mean, you know, uh, things would slow down. But actually what it really does is it provides legit legitimacy uh, into the market. Once something is regulated, you're saying, this is real, this is here to stay, and we've got to figure it out. So I think broadly speaking, that kind of regulation is positive. And also one thing that Hong Kong has demonstrated, because if you consider their views even just a few years ago to where it's adapted itself to where it is today, we've seen that Hong Kong is absolutely okay to reconsider its positions. So that means that over time, you know, when they see how the market evolves, they've demonstrated to be market, not just market friendly, but also market aware, meaning that they're basically changing the policies or adapting themselves to based on uh, sort of what the market, uh, what the market is looking for. So that means that in this case, you know, with the new vast classes, obviously, you know, when, when you're thinking about uh, sort of the, the regular regime of assets, yes, it's obviously focused to make sure that, you know, it complies with KYC, AML, all that kind of stuff, and that there's a regulatory regime around it. That's not to say that it is the only way to implement it, but it's a starting point. And through that approach, those companies that are now receiving that initial license for them are going to be operating a certain way and will then say what does and doesn't work uh, in that construct. Uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm very positive of what's happening. You can see the developments in Hong Kong as well. It's, uh, you know, it's a signal. Okay, so you, now you have a licensing regime, followed by the fact that the Hong Kong Stock Exchange has launched a number of crypto ETFs, or the fact that the HKMA has done a tokenized green bond. I mean, that's possibly the first government agency in the world that has tokenized anything from within a framework. And all of this really happened after the end of October when the announcement happened. I mean, that in itself has to be also somewhat applauded that over a period of six months, really, Hong Kong has done so much progress That's and is actually that, looking at yes. opening even more, right? Absolutely. That makes me super excited as well. I couldn't agree more. Uh, but given, as you know, uh, Securities and Futures Commission is having a public consultation in Hong Kong on the proposed regulatory requirement for these, you know, VASP um, mm -hmm. operators licensed by SFC and it's due this Friday, March 31st. Sure. What are what are your three recommendations, you know, would you have uh, to SFC? Well, I'm not sure if it's necessarily three recommendations, right? But I think the general framework, I think, applies to most regulatory approaches. The first one is to ensure that whatever framework that they put forward isn't overly restrictive to stifle innovation, right? And I think they're very aware of that one. Uh, and uh, and, and the, the second one, I think, which is also interesting is the conversation as to how can we actually get participation more broadly to not just a sophisticated investor base, but also one that is, you know, you know, what, what are the safety rails or guardrails we can put forward to have a broader market participate as a whole, which I know is, you know, a part of the sort of, um, you know, other areas of consultation about thinking around that. This to yeah, me is actually the retail. exactly yeah. for the retail. That is exciting. Um, and, and the reason why I think this is important is because part of the promise and hope of the whole digital asset space is inclusion. One of the biggest challenges that we have in the broad financial segment of the world, so this isn't actually related just to crypto, this is just broadly speaking in the finance world, is that inadvertently we've created an exclusionary framework by these, having this sophisticated investor framework for all the right reasons, which is that we want to protect, obviously, 
um, you know, uh, retail investors from, you know, if they don't have the knowledge to basically do things uh, that might be dangerous for them. On the other hand, though, it's also excluded them from some of the type of investments that would have allowed them to basically participate in, you know, um, in, in the kind of growth that would have provided more equity. It's a, it's a little bit like saying, oh, you live in Hong Kong, but you're not allowed to buy real estate. <laughs> right? Right. I mean, <laughs> imagine, imagine what that would have looked like, uh, say, 20, 25 years ago or 30 years ago for people in Hong Kong. Naturally speaking, that didn't happen because most people would have thought of buying real estate for people's homes, but also was an incredible source of wealth. In fact, generational wealth that helped basically advance people in Hong Kong and, and in the world. It's not just exclusively to Hong Kong. So, so that's kind of, you know, how do you bring that up? And, and what we see in the Web3 space is that people who have financial knowledge are actually also tied to people who are quite aware of digital assets in Web3 and crypto, broadly speaking. So how can we tie that in? Um, and what I would love to see, you know, above and beyond sort of the sort of regulatory approach, which I know is important and, 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 and needs to be done, is maybe a way in which we can bring more people into a framework where they can be financially knowledgeable, right? So what is that framework is to be determined, but trying to get more people to become qualified for this, because I would also argue that you can have financial knowledge and awareness without necessarily having the financial wealth attached to it, right? So in different countries, you have different relationships to, okay, you are a sophisticated investor, because you have X number of dollars. I don't know if that's necessarily true uh, in context, right? Um, and also there's different areas of, and again, I'm not going to speak, <laughs> I'm not going to speak to people's personal risk appetites, right? But there's a very different risk profile, even if you think about entrepreneurs, like I look at it from the lens of an entrepreneur. Sure, right? Um, I could make an investment as a young entrepreneur and I could potentially, you know, take a big risk on that, but, um, you know, I might be excluded from doing that because I am not a sophisticated investor because I lack the financial resources to qualify for that. Like I, have, I don't have a certain minimum amount of wealth. However, that same individual entrepreneur is absolutely allowed to build his own business, to put all his money in his own business, to potentially lose all his money in his own business. Uh, and still that somehow is okay. Right. And while I understand you know, the absolute nuance and difference between the two, the risk profile in many ways is shared across. So to me, it feels a little bit hypocritical as well to say, I'm not allowed to put risk capital at work on someone I trust, but I am allowed to put all my capital at risk on everything I do, even though I'm probably not a trained entrepreneur, right? There's no, nobody comes out of school being a trained entrepreneur. Nobody, so, but then, we can't say to young entrepreneurs coming out of college to say, you're not allowed to be an entrepreneur until you're 30 and until you have a million dollars of cash. Do you know what I mean? Right. Like, like, like um, you, what would happen to innovation if that's what we did? So I think there's a lesson. You know, I don't have the full answer, but there is a lesson towards that gap that does feel um, there is a gap between them. And, and this is an opportunity maybe to try to bridge that gap somehow between the two. Um, and obviously hoping we can come to a, a happy conclusion uh, where maybe we can bring more financial inclusion and uh, without necessarily having this wealth barrier, because otherwise it, it really means that only the ones who have wealth can build more wealth. And I think I really hope so. As, yes, I really hope so as well. And I'm, I, I guess every one of us are very looking forward to see the you know, after the consultation is done and to see what will be the proposal by the FCC. I think that is yet to be discovered in yes. a positive way, for sure. Yes, of course, of course. Yes, so, well, I understand I'm mindful of the time, but thanks so much for joining. Uh, my, I guess, two last questions. What is your outlook for 2023? And last but not least, what will be the one last piece of advice or takeaway for our audience today? So, I mean, generally speaking, our outlook for 2023, I think if anything that we can see so far, we've said this earlier already, but we believe that 2023 could potentially be a real breakout year uh, for the whole Web3 crypto space. I know a lot of the chatter is around AI, but as I said earlier, AI and sort of digital provenance, which is part of blockchain is very much tied together. When you take a look at what just happened at the start of the year relative to where you know, um, 
sort of, you know, the, you know, Bitcoin and Ethereum moved relative to the broader market. I think it's indicative of a little bit where sentiment and thoughts are around that. And I think we can forecast the rest of the year what's going to happen because we can probably make some predictions around, you know, um, where the rates are going to go and where the printer is going to go. <laughs> so we can make some <laughs> macro assumptions. But then separately speaking, adoption as well in Web3, the fundamentals of the utility in the culture is rising at a rapid pace. And one of the things that we've always said is that, you know, uh, NFTs are stores of culture, but ultimately culture is what drives an economy. If you think about everything that we purchase today, whether it's a house, whether it's a car, whether it's our clothes, we're engaging in forms of culture, right? Culture isn't just about buying, you know, what you watch in the movies or what video games you play. It's actually how you live your life, right? Even food is culture, right? Chinese food is culture, for instance. It's in fact one of our most popular, ex you know, it's probably our most popular uh, external uh, sort of culture influencer, Chinese food, right? If you think of it this way, right? And, and so these are the things that matter to an economy and non-fungible tokens and, and sort of the metaverse is effectively the containers and the driver for those digital cultures. So this will come even faster as more people join the Web3 space because they're excited about the culture of Web3, not because they're here primarily for the financial uh, financial values, which is what's been driving you know, much of the industry in the last few years and has culminated in some of the disasters of last year because of this excessive greed that has taken place, whereas culture and traditions and those type of values are much more long lasting and much more sustainable. So generally speaking, we think culture will drive uh, the ecosystem growth in 2023. Um, it will come, we think, primarily from gaming at start. You know, we think, you know, the first 100 to 200 plus million users are going to join the ecosystem because of that on a pathway towards a billion user adoption. So I think that's the, the pathway that we're sort of really excited about. And, and NFTs will be front and center of that. Uh, so that's our prediction for 2023. In terms of the advice we have for the audience today, I mean, there's a lot, I would say, that generally speaking, I would say that, um, you know, uh, to us, this is very much like how the internet, um, an opportunity to sort of shape the internet as it was sort of, you know, 20, 25 years ago, or even 30 years ago. And if you were going to play a part in this one, what's your part you want to play in this, right? And you have a chance, and this is not just, this is for you individually, but also for Hong Kong as a place to actually make a real mark. Because when you think about what happened in the internet, because the region was somewhat slow to adopt, ultimately it became dependent on third parties, or really, if you think about it, mostly American technology uh, on this, right? right? Like today, what do we use? We use Facebook, we use Amazon, we use Instagram, we use basically everything that's made outside of the region. And I think right. here we have an opportunity to do that. And everyone here who's, who's listening can take uh, sort of shape and, and play a part in making this work. So I would say to the audience, you know, what part do you want to play in shaping this future of Web3? Great. Well, thank you so much for sharing. Yeah, great talking to you. And I look forward to hosting you in the near future in person. Absolutely. I look forward to that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah.